Before we welcome today's panel, we have a few housekeeping op, uh, items. Remember to download the mobile app to see the schedule, attendees, sponsor, and sponsors to make the most of your time at the Polys. And be sure to hit sync at the app's home screen to see any updates. One big update to share, due to the high wind advisories, tonight's Hall of Fame and Campaign Excellence Awards dinner will have to move inside. If you've RSVP'd, we'll see you here in the ballroom at 7 p.m. for our industry's highest honors. Finally, don't miss the silent auction items right outside in the foyer. We have four fabulous prizes, including vacation homes in Hawaii and Palm Springs, Broadway tickets to a show and city of your choice, and eight bottles of top-rated Cabernet Sauvignon, oh gosh, Cabernet Sauvignon, with, um, one, with a wine suitcase. All of the funds raised support the AAPC Foundation's work to protect the industry and promote the next generation of political consultants. You can also support the foundation in whatever way you can by taking out your phones, scanning the QR codes on your table, and making a donation right now. Speaking of donations, I'm excited to share that yesterday's inaugural AAPC Foundation Cup raised over $50,000 in revenue. Please join me in welcoming our title sponsor for our tournament, Home Team Sports and Political Marketing and Media, Steve Allman. Welcome everybody, welcome. Uh, just a quick note, I had a uh, sports table out there uh, when you first entered with had a lot of gear on it yesterday. I, I noticed it's been picked clean. Uh, I couldn't carry every team in the United States with me, so if you have a team and you want a hat or a shirt or something, just come and see me afterwards. I'll make sure I get you one. Uh, Phillies, Flyers, Sixers, Eagles preferred. Uh, sorry. I just wanted to also, <laughs> there we go, one, one Philly fan, great. Uh, we had, so we also had uh, over 100 players yesterday uh, anybody who plays golf, the fact that we finish that in around five hours is absolutely amazing. That's usually eight hours, and after the tequila hole, you don't really remember much. So uh, that was a pretty amazing uh, accomplishment. So thank you for everybody who came out. Gorgeous day. Uh, courses like that, you don't even care where the ball goes. Uh, so what I'm going to do first is just wanted to announce the winners. There was some contests yesterday. Uh, and so the first one up is the longest drive. Uh, and that was won by Keyes Norton with approximately 300-yard drive. I, I did drive it and saw him. He was way out of there. So congratulations on that. The second one it was the closest to the center. Uh, this is another one where Tracy Dietz's name was on the, on the closest. And then Brad Mont got in looked about two, two or three inches from the line. Amazing. Brad Mont won that one. Congrats. Closest to the pin on number 13 was Locke White. Seven feet from the pin. Nice shot. I don't know if he made the birdie putt or not. Did they make the putt? Anybody know? No? OK. Uh, the winning of the putting contest was Sam Peters, wherever he is. OK. And then, the, the low, and then it was obviously the low score for, for all teams. And the low, winning score was 62. Uh, Brian Frazier, Joe DeBose, Sam Peters, and Steve Hilding. What's interesting is that they actually won that in a playoff hole on the number nine, number one handicap hole, uh, with a birdie beating Jim Innocenzi's team. So, uh, now I, you know, I don't know if that had anything to do with Jim picking up that ball in the sand trap and throwing it on the green, but maybe not. Uh, so congratulations to all the winners, and uh, hopefully we'll be doing that again next year uh, or the year after. I don't know if we'll do it in D.C., but uh, next, in any exotic location coming up. Uh, I just also wanted to say uh, great turnout for AAPC. I, I'm hearing we're close to 1,000 people, which is just insane. I don't think I've, ever, I've been around for a long time, haven't seen that number right back. So that, that is great. Um, and I, I'm referring to this as the Academy Awards of, of campaign events versus the Nickelodeon Awards that would happen in Vegas a couple weeks ago. So uh, if you want to know why I say that, feel free to seek, seek me out. Um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> We're going to go on. I'm just going to take you through a few slides, very general, just for some people that maybe are new on, on what we do. Uh, we basically represent all the sports properties, both local and national, for television, radio, and digital properties. We also have local uh, news properties and national news networks as well. But we're pretty much all about live viewing, no matter where people uh, do that. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the sports. So here's a map of all the regional sports networks in the country. 
Um, you're probably reading a lot about the changes that are going on with this. It's, it's, it's a pretty crazy time right now, but all these local games are going to be somewhere. They might be streamed, they might be on an MLB network, they could be on a platform like Amazon. Right now they're on the regional sports networks in, in every city and every uh, team. Every single team you see there, baseball, basketball, hockey, all these teams in D.C., you're watching the Nationals on Masson. Out in L.A., you're watching the Dodgers on Spectrum, et cetera. Uh, they're all going to exist like this, and they're on every night of the week. There were some new insights, and we're all research geeks here. So uh, I wanted to join this Vision Insights is a group that really drilled down on the Super Bowl this year. And they have become kind of one of the premier live sports, sports engagement companies. And, and, and I'll, I'll put a side note here. I'm trying to work with groups like Blue Labs and Deep Root and all, all the guys that are in our space to get more specific voter data on home team fans specifically, because that's a passionate group of people. You don't find them elsewhere. There's a lot of unique reach there. So how do we reach these people? It's, it's grandparents, parents, and kids all wearing the Yankees uniform. It's, no other kind of piece of content does that. How do we get see what their political leanings are? Uh, so we're going to work on that. I think the last study we did was way back in 2015, which is you know, pre-Trump. So we definitely want to update that. But here's some information that we got from recently. So what they're talking about is uh, these home team fans are what they call forever fans. My love for sports is part of my identity, just like I happen to mention Philly 14 times every time I'm up here. But I didn't choose that. My dad said, here's a Phillies cap. I didn't choose the worst, losing, most losing team in the history of baseball. As my, I was just given that. And like most people here, that's what happens. Or you move somewhere and you become, all of a sudden, a Kansas City Chiefs fan. But that happens. Uh, uh, very early in life, and you pretty much stick with that forever. I'm with somebody from LA, and they wanted to tune in the Rangers and the Knicks game last night, and I was like, you've lived in California for 30 years. Yeah, but I was born and raised in New York. And so they still follow all their New York teams. So the second thing about that is tenure. So right, what age did you become a team fan? Usually it's somewhere between zero and 17. So these people are watching these games for their entire lives, and it's part of their identity. That doesn't happen with CSI. That doesn't happen with The Bachelor. It doesn't happen with news. It doesn't happen anywhere else but in sports. And we're calling that the forever fan, basically. And what goes on here, and this is, you know, for, again, general market, but I got to think it's going to affect voting as well. They go to the company's website, almost 132% more likely than other stuff. I go to the company's app. I look up the brand on social media. I talk to friends' family about the brand. I purchase the brand's products. Well, you su substitute candidate or ballot for brand, and those are all really high indexes. It's, it's ridiculously off the charts how passionate people are uh, about sports and then the people who support those sports. I'm sure everybody in here can name, you know, if you're in Boston, you know W.B. Mason, and I'm in Philly, and I know Tasty Cake. And anybody who ever provided sports and sponsorship in my teams, I know. I just know it. Not because I want to, again, it's just in my brain, and that's what we're trying to do is get brain and engagement, uh, brain space and engagement from voters. Two and a half times more likely to watch their team. So again, I might watch 50, 60 Phillies games. Uh, rarely has my wife asked me to crack a beer and watch a Milwaukee Brewers Cleveland Indians game. Ne you know, never happened. Um, but I'm watching all my local games and, and that's what pretty much the whole country does. Six and a half times that a regular viewer I, I use every possible medium to stay connected. So right, not only TV, but streaming. Not only streaming, but radio broadcast. I'm down the beach, I'm listening to the game. I'm on a blog, I'm, a, I'm talking to people, I'm watching my sports beat by. It's, it's an entire culture, right? There's a real reason it's a several billion dollar business and why people like the NFL and all these guys get these deals and why they're paying my quarterback $252 million for five years. There's some money there. Uh, so th this is a, a huge industry that really permeates the whole country. And it's just a matter of how do we get these messages. And, how, and it's also very important about the creative, obviously, that runs in these uh, because these fans are really tuned in. Just something I always, people always ask me, you know, ESPN, Fox, sports, our, our, our network numbers are like 90, 10 men and women. So it is much more likely, again, but those are generic games. How many people are tuning into a Yankee Red Sox game on ESPN? Mostly baseball guys, sports. If you don't live in New York or Boston, you really don't care that much about that. But when it's local, you, you know a lot about it. It's a third of our audience, 40% of baseball are women. So it's almost a 50-50 split, which is amazing for sports. 35% in, in uh, NBA and 33% in hockey. So a full third to 40% of our viewers are women. And what we did is a study on one of our insurance brands that did something. We did a post, and this is a buy on Women 2554. That's the main demo. The number one program they bought 
in all four quarters was sports, local sports. That, that, that right one's NBA, and then there's hockey, and, and then MLB on that far uh, right third quarter. That was the number one impressions delivered on their, on their buy. Uh, and then all the other ratings came for all the other networks. And so again, 10 years ago, those networks were probably averaging twos, threes, fours, and women demos. Today, the average cable network delivers a 0.6. And those sports ratings have been around a one and a half, two or three in women for 30 years. And there's still a one and a half, two or three for women, depending on the team, Red Sox, for example. But all the other numbers have shrunk. And so we have a C of 0.1s to 0.4s across all the other programming, prime, news, et cetera. And that's, that glacier has melted, to use a climate change analogy. Uh, the glacier's melted, but the mountain that's underneath the glacier is sports. It's, everybody's been watching the Yankees and the Phillies. And all, whether they're good or bad, they've been watching them forever, and they continue to watch them. Unfortunately, all the other stuff has gone into fragmentation. And so that's why you just want to look at it. Even if you have a woman buy, you just send us a number, and we'll give you the ratings, and we'll see how they rank versus the rest of the uh, broadcast prime and cable. This was just another real quick hit on the streaming. So you know, 19 million, about 18% of, of the... Uh, oh, the audience watches it exclusively on streaming. So they're not even necessarily tuning into an RSN. They've signed up for streaming, and they're watching their local team through a streaming app. So we do have inventory there. We do have dynamic insertion on all the local teams. So uh, that's one thing you don't want to miss. You, that's almost a full 20% of your, a fifth of your, uh, your target. And the same thing with incremental reach on the, from linear is almost an over 22% increase in reach by adding the streaming platform. Um, so we do, like I said, do with local insertion. We also do all the outer market stuff. So a Yankee fan living in Michigan still wants to watch the Yankee games. They stream them, but they're still voting in Michigan. We'll get those guys too. So whether it's the local team or the outer market, we'll also get them. So that's the snapshot. I just wanted to say thank you again and uh, have a good show. And uh, we'll see you around town. Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for attending our morning session here on polling. I'm Jim Ellis, president of Ellis Insight, which is an election analysis firm. So I provide uh, really political information to people you try to raise money from, but basically. And uh, so we are here to discuss the polling situation around the country, and our panelists include, and you can read their bios, but we have Jill Normington, Normington from Normington Pets, Democratic pollster, Brenda Giannini with the Axis Research, Republican pollster, Brett Lloyd from the Bullfinch Group, which is uh, not a purple group right now, <clears throat> excuse me, used to uh, work with Kellyanne Conway and is a member of the planning committee for this excellent conference that we've had. And then Rosa Mendoza with the Global Strategy Group, the Democratic Pollsters. So we're going to get right into it today because we're running a little bit behind on schedules. So uh, we want to start with something to get you thinking about polling and the, the proper use of polling. And in our pre-calls, the four of us had, the five of us with me, had we, uh, Jill made an interesting comment that I want to start with to get people going. And we were talking about ballot tests and whether they're covered as accurate or inaccurate. And Jill said that's not the proper use of polling, ballot tests. So Jill, why don't you tell us what the best use of polling is and expand on those comments that you made. Sure. Um, you know, I sit on a, a lot of panels and I make this comment all the, uh, all the time. Um, and that is that uh, a poll is not meant to predict the outcome of an election. I don't care what you read in the aggregator sites. I know that is what people like think we're in the business of. Um, but this isn't Vegas, and we're not in the business of trying to figure out who is going to win and who's going to lose. All of us who do this work all of the time think about our work in a very different way. You know, when I'm, when I'm pitching a client, I say to them, if you had all the time in the world and all the money in the world, you wouldn't need me. Because what a poll is meant to do, especially on a campaign situation, what media polls do are very, very different from what we do as campaign pollsters. Our work is meant to be used as a decision-making tool. It is an efficiency tool because, uh, you know, if you really did have all the time in the world and all the money in the world, you could use every media 
service available to you. You could say everything to everyone as many times as you wanted, but campaigns have real decisions to make based upon their budgets, and they use our work to make those decisions. What should you be saying about yourself? What should you be saying about your opponent? To whom? How many times? Through what media? Our work is a decision-making tool tool inside of a campaign. And if you're using it to try to say, you know, we're going to win or we're going to lose, I mean, we're all guilty of writing that memo. <laughs> I'll be the first person to admit it. Um, because, you know, we do need uh, the cash that comes from that from a campaign perspective. But that is not the proper use of polling. Very good. So, Jill, in terms of budgeting, you mentioned what is a, a, a good rule of thumb in terms of a polling budget for a campaign? And I know, of course, it differs in every campaign, and it depends if it's statewide or a district campaign, but generally, from a percentage basis of a campaign budget, what would you recommend for a full program in terms of a dollar? So it's, it's all relative to how much you're spending in terms of the, your communications budget. And when I say communications, I mean anything that includes direct voter contact. So that includes field, that includes what you're doing in terms of paid across all the spectrums, but the, the general sort of rule of thumb is for that number to be somewhere between eight and 10% of your total communications budget. If you, if you really think about it, um, if you're talking, although let's be clear, if you're running one of those huge statewide Senate campaigns and you're gonna spend $70 million on paid, I'm not sure you could actually do $7 million <laughs> worth of research over the course of a year and a half. I mean, I could try. <laughs> I could for sure try. Um, so obviously the percentage goes down when you're talking about those mega campaigns, but for your average um, congressional campaign, you, that's where you should be. I'd like to add for all the GCs yep. out there, the pollster should get twice what the media guy gets. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good real, a real, a ratio, a good rule of thumb. So Brenda, in, you know, the way the media has been covering polling since 2016, really, uh, the stories about inaccuracies, and again, they re relate to the ballot, excuse me, ballot tests, and we have really uh, different sets of polling. We have the professional pollsters like you all. We've got the media polls, which often are not particularly accurate, and of course the university polls. So when you're talking to clients and you're advising campaigns, how do you steer them in the right direction in terms of uh, handling the accuracy questions, or how do you brief them on what they should be looking for in terms of analyzing the polls that you provide them? Thank you. I love this question. After 2016, I got a call from my mother and said, should I lie about what you do for a living, like a more honest profession? <laughs> and I said, absolutely not. Like, what pollsters do, what, what the four of us do here uh, is very different from what you read in the news. Yes, there's a lot of problems with polling. We saw in 2016, we saw in 2020. It wasn't necessarily by us here on stage. If you look at the media polls, uh, Jill just beautifully described what we do. We do polling to advise strategy, to advise tactics. How are we going to run these campaigns? Media polls are designed for one thing, right? Eyeballs or clicks. Right. That's what they're designed. They're designed to get you to, to look at something, to read something, to click through. So it's a very different objective. And they also have very different budgets. Uh, polling, I joke, it's nowhere near the media guy's budget. We're always begging for a few thousand dollars. Um, but polling is expensive, and we know that media budgets have been cut. Um, so you have uh, journalists that are amazing, that write these wonderful articles that often make us cry when they're talking about our candidates. But very talented um, professionals, but you know, they didn't take Calc 4. You know, these aren't people that should be analyzing polls. Um, so sometimes the output that you're reading um, is, is often inaccurate. Um, my favorite is when they talk about percent change. I'm like, oh, Ugh. please call us. Um, but so it's very different, and that's what happened in 2022. Particularly, you had this just explosion of public polls, and you did have some Republicans with a loud megaphone talking about there was going to be this landslide election. I don't think anybody up here thought it was going to be a landslide election. Um, so when you're looking at polls, really look at who's the, who's the vehicle, who's delivering the poll, what the methodology is, um, and if it's trustworthy. If it's somebody you've never heard of, um, my favorite are the university polls, filled it over three weeks. So much happens in a campaign right. over three weeks. That data is meaningless. 
Um, so just really kind of take it with a grain of salt. And yes, every once in a while we will leak our data um, to, to raise money usually. I would even question that. <laughs> so. So, so, Brenda, the various methodologies now you mentioned in terms of how polls are conducted, and others hop in on this too if you want. Um, how, do you, how do you run your polls? Live interviews? Do you use interactive voice response, online, all of the above? How, how uh, in terms of advising clients, what methodologies do you recommend? So we use a blend, and I'm guessing most of us up here do. Um, what we've learned uh, since 2016 is you have to reach the voters where they are, right? So a lot of people didn't reach Trump voters in 2016 and 2020 because they weren't doing online. Trump voters, we know, they're Facebook voters. Uh, they live online, so that's how you find them. Um, but you also still need landline. You need to get those rural households. You have to have a, a huge cell component to get younger voters. Um, you can do text to web. Where you run into problems, and look at this, please, when you look at those public polls, when people are using all of them. IVR, cells, landline, text to web, panels. Yes. You can't merge all of those together at one, and that's a big red flag with media polls. Um, but there's also, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, applications of some of those. Like, a lot, probably most of us aren't fan of panels for voter polls. But let's say I want um, Hispanic women between 35 and 45. A panel is perfect for that kind of message research. So that's what we've found. I don't know about you guys. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and we can take that further in the reasoning for why it's perfect for that demographics because it allows them with the flexibility to take the poll at the point in time in which is most favorable to them. So whether that be in the morning, during lunch break, or after they drop the kids off at daycare, whatnot, um, that type of flexibility is something that's particularly helpful with, with voters of color. Very good. Brett, the Bullfinch Group recently completed a national poll and if you'd care to share some of the results of that, and, and how can consultants here take that national issue data that you've you developed and research and use it to their best benefit in their own campaigns? Yeah, sure. Bullfinch Group has been making some of our national polls public over the last two or three years. And we recently got out uh, of the field with the national poll. I think the biggest takeaway I saw now uh, or in this most recent poll was uh, generic ballot. I generally don't care about the generic ballot in an off year, it's not something I'm tracking. Um, but what I saw is kind of a pretty big shift from Q1 of 2022 to Q1 of 2023. Um, went from a Republican edge to a Democratic edge, but interestingly, that Democratic edge, it wasn't that more people were suggesting that they wanted to vote for a Democrat, it's that more people were saying other or unsure. To the point of now, I mean, if you look at the real clear politics generic ballot of a couple surveys done earlier this year, you'll see that 15, 20% of folks now are saying unsure or other in terms of Republican or Democrat, which one do, would you rather vote for? We see it in Gallup data, right? Where uh, the March Gallup party affiliation, uh, affiliation for Republicans was 25%, affiliation for Democratic, uh, as a Democratic was 25%. So we're seeing this kind of fall off, I think, of wanting to jump in right now to a party. And how do you use this? Well, it's gonna be tricky in a, in a primary year to kind of court the, uh, court the middle and not the base, but I would say that that's something you gotta look at. You gotta look at a message that says we need people to work together or come together or willing to work across the aisle or get bipartisan work done. Um, and that's what, that's what I would say I'm seeing from this data right now. Yeah, and also, and, and Brett, as you and I were talking before we started, that in looking at those generic numbers, you're seeing, as we talked, 25% Democrat, 25% Republican, and 50% unaffiliated or other, as you were talking about. So how do you advise your clients then in terms of identifying that 50% who identify as other, unaffiliated, independent, when we know they're not? Right, most, they're of not. Them, most of them right. lean one way or another. And, and how do you advise people on how to identify that sector in terms of to direct a message to those independents or so-called independents? Sure, yeah, there, to be honest, we see a lot of spectrums made up uh, with data sets and things like that that go from like R to D or D to R um, and not much uh, care of what the independent or centrist or mo uh, moderate would be. Um, so I would really take out, the, I would take that and I'd kind of expand it a little bit and I'd say, okay, these, 
independents are the 50% of people right now that aren't affiliating with a party. They're not independent. They're not going to vote for a third party candidate. Right. That's not what's going to happen. But we need to figure out why they're not right now latching on to a party. And I think it's, it's, it would be of concern to me uh, as a Republican or Democratic strategist right now of saying, this is an open field. This is right now is the time to go and get these voters. We need to be figuring out what this moderate is looking for and why people aren't gravitating towards our party. The solidifying of the base, if only 25%, if you're only getting in a quarter of people that are affiliating with your party, solidifying of your base isn't going to necessarily win you any elections right now. Right. <laughs> well, it's yeah. worth getting out of bed to listen to polling. You got fresh data. Right. <laughs> Uh, Rosa, we uh, we were also talking too, and, and as uh, as you go through the 2022 election, what surprised me at the end was not so much how if this was a Democrat overperformance or a Republican underperformance. I think you can make an argument either way on that, but what surprised me was the incumbent protect, uh, retention numbers. And if you looked at the early data where we were seeing these numbers that were showing right track, wrong track, sometimes up at 70%, Biden's numbers were not very good. They were commensurate with Trump's numbers back in 2018 when the Democrats gained 41 seats in the House. We didn't see that type of relation then to how people voted. And I think the abortion issue, uh, at least in terms of issue polls, I, I think was, was missed from a standpoint of intensity and as a vote driver. And, and if you look at the incumbent retention, you had 56 senators and governors run for re-election, and 55 of them won. Mm -hmm. And the retention factor in the House of the 372 incumbents who ran for re-election was 98.1. Yet the, the public was demanding change. I mean, how, what happened there? Why was there a disconnect? Yeah, no, great question. So. I think the first thing that I want to unpack is that it wasn't just about the jobs decision, which I think a lot of people make the assumption that it was this one particular subject that led to the non-existing red wave that we actually saw, but that wasn't the case. There were, there were multiple issues. So for sure, the Dobbs decision had a major impact. Even in the summer when the leaked decision was, was released, we were already seeing a shift in polling. So we already knew what was potentially happening that fall based off the results that we were noticing, and that's among suburban women, among swing voters in particular, where you're seeing that a super majority of voters were actually in support of Roe v. Wade and not for it to be overturned. And so when you're, when you're noticing the Republicans are kind of in the wrong side of this to a large extent, that was certainly gonna have an impact. I think it's less about the yes or no on DOPS and, and, and the actual positioning the Republicans had on abortion, but rather more so the positioning the Republicans had on how extreme they were on abortion. Because if you're looking at which, um, which ones we actually kept, which House uh, seats we actually kept, you're looking at um, a lot of Republican challengers that were saying, you know, we, we are against abortion, even in the case of rape and incest. And it's really that, that extreme angle of where you are in the spectrum of abortion that really led to the retention for Democrats that, that we actually craw, that we saw across the battlefield. But that's only one component of it. I think another component of it also had to do with January 6th and um, uh, the perspective of whether or not the election was stolen from President Trump in 2020. I think there were a lot of Republicans who were also very extreme in that, in that perspective. And so to your point about voters wanting somebody that's a little bit more bipartisan, somebody that's a little bit more mainstream and understands both sides of the aisle and can work with both, of the, both sides of the aisle. When you presented voters with the perspectives and the very extreme perspectives that a lot of Republicans unfortunately had this cycle, then at that point, you know, that, that's where we actually started to see the margins shift, at least on the generic ballot and therefore the named um, ballot for some of these, for some of these members. Um, but I also think the top of the ticket had a lot to do with it, right? Like we were talking about this a little bit earlier, right. but in, in Ohio and in Arizona, we saw very different dynamics. We did. Um, in, in Arizona, we, we saw great dynamics for Democrats on the top of the ticket, but not so great um, as, as we looked at some congressional pickups that Republicans had this past cycle. Opposite happened in Ohio. But 
also to a certain extent, and it wasn't just the top of the ticket dynamics that we also saw in New York and in Florida, but also the redistricting that happened. Yes in New York and Florida that was severely against anything that Democrats wanted out of either of those maps. Um, now, hopefully in New York, we'll hopefully see some changes leading into, into next year. Florida, it'll likely stay the same. But if you are looking at you know, what happened in 2020 and what could potentially happen in 24, you are looking at does the Dobbs decision continue to have an impact? Where are Republicans going to shift maybe their dynamics on, on where they are on abortion? And if they don't, then that's certainly fruitful for Democrats across the board. Um, but also, where are they on you know, what's happening at the presidential level um, and how extreme they are in that perspective as we lead into 2024? Because, I, I, again, the extremism on either end, because we certainly see it on our ends as well, it's not helpful, and it's certainly not what swing voters across the nation want, let alone where we are looking to actually see some pickups. If well, I could add to that, yes, please. I think she's 100%. Uh, right, a, a candidate <laughs> quality was a huge issue. The Dobbs decision was a huge issue. I also think those, the numbers you talked to really show the voters are exhausted. They voted for the status quo. They, they like the calm. You know, that's why voters are, the voters that are sticking with Biden are staying behind him. Um, they're just exhausted from the, the Trump circus. And I think that was the only thing I would add. Yeah. I, I want to pick up one of the, uh, on that a little bit, which is that you know, one of the things that we all do um, with our data in an attempt to try to figure out where things are going at least towards the end is a pretty deep analysis of the people who tell us they are undecided over the course of of the uh over the course of the election, and especially in those closing four weeks of the campaign, we work really hard to try to figure out who are those last people so that we can talk to them and try to convince them to, to side with, uh, with our campaign. Um, and one of the things that uh, political science will tell you over and over again to your initial question is that you should be looking at the incumbent president's job approval rating to help you allocate those votes um, as you go through. And to your uh, uh, initial question, Biden's job approval rating was bad. But Biden's job approval rating was also historically bad among his own partisans. So normally, um, the, if you look underneath the hood of a, of a job approval rating, you'll, you're able to look at what uh, Democrats think, what independents think, what Republicans think, and usually, um, you know, the opposing party thinks very poorly of the, the, of, of the president when he, that he's not a member of their party. I'm gonna say he, because they're all dudes. Um, and, uh, you know, independents are somewhere in the middle, but in 2022, we actually saw Biden's job approval rating among Democrats be historically low. Sometimes in some states it was in the 70s, it was mostly in the 80s. Those numbers are traditionally in the 90s yeah. among your own partisans. And so if you were using Biden's job approval to try to predict what was going to happen in a particular place, you were missing a big part of the story, which which was that all of those Democrats who are like, meh, I don't really like Joe Biden, they all voted for Democrats for Senate, they all voted for Democrats for governor, they all voted for Democrats for the House. So if you were looking and just using job approval or right direction, wrong track, you were missing a big part of the story in the numbers, which was that all of those partisans ended up coming home at the end of the day. Let's talk about turnout forecasting for a second. As we look at this 2024 presidential race, I think the one thing we all can agree on here, this is going to be an extreme election. <laughs> uh, but if it's Trump and Biden again, I'm, I'm kind of of the mindset that the turnout's actually gonna be lower than what we've seen. Would you all agree with that? And secondly, how do you help your clients forecast what the turnout may be in their particular election? Anybody? I, I'll disagree. I think turnout would be huge. Nobody turns out voters like Donald Trump, both on the Republican side and the Democratic side. Um, so I think Democrats would come out in force, even if they aren't enthused with Biden. 
um, because they, they don't want another four years of Donald Trump. Um, and, and I think um, the anti-Trump Republicans would come out to, to defeat uh, Trump. And obviously, he's got that core third of the Republican Party as his base. But don't you think, too, that we see numbers that show 57, 60% wish there were other candidates? Yes. They wish there were other candidates. But if, so if Trump a lot is of a just nominee, I'm not going to even bother with this. We'll see high turnout. And how we predict that, there's one thing that predicts voter turnout like nothing else we could ever devise. It's if you voted before. If you showed up in the past, you're more likely to show up again. Mm -hmm. So I think most of you all deal with voter files. You know, we can see. I can't see how you voted, but I can see if you showed up. Um, so we use those models. Of course, we incorporate, you know, first-time registrants. You know, there's going to be that random person that, that decides to turn out for the first time. But the majority of our turnout predictions are people that actually showed up in the past. Okay. That's also, how we do it. Also really yeah. important to note is kind of ease of ballot access now, or, or the ability to, you know, you can early vote many places. I mean, the ability to vote now isn't you have to go wait in a three-hour line on election day. And, and the timing as to when you can deliver messages is completely different than Right, it but that yeah. also goes to kind of the voter turnout of these, yes, or it does. voting, not necessarily turnout. But it does, <laughs> yeah, right. So we're going to go to questions here in a couple of seconds. So if you have some questions, begin to get ready for that and maybe raise your hands. But I want to ask one other one before we do that. We see a lot of change in the election system. We see some states going to a top two primary now. And this ranked choice voting, which has taken place, began in Maine. We see a lot of cities going to it. We now see Alaska going to a top four. How do you advise clients on, on that particular thing where voters now may have more than one choice in who they vote for? How, how, how can you help their, your clients guide through that type of a morass of a new system? And anybody? I, I, I kind of look at it as if you've ever worked in like the Louisiana jungle primary before. It's right. you, you got to make sure that uh, your negatives <laughs> aren't terribly high, that you could be a second a second place vote for somebody. Um, so do you question that too? Do you ask people who would your second choice be in the, oh, sure. in the oh, questionnaire? Oh, yeah. yeah. So we do and, Alaska. Oh, go ahead. And go all the way down. Right? All the way down. If, right. if it is top four, we're going, we're going to ask we're for We're going to ask six. for all four. So when you have, let's take that Alaska, if, you, if you're pulling that race, originally that special election, they had 48 names on the ballot. So how do you really get a ballot test for something like that? What, what, have, what have you done to, to sort of go through that? 48 names. I mean, you're not reading 48 names to people, right? No. So having worked that race, so you really had six legitimate candidates, six legitimate. really probably three. Uh -huh. um, so you ask those six, or you say, or somebody else. Mm -hmm. And you keep oh, going through the cycle. And then we, you know, when we report that out to the client, hey, if you don't get, if you don't win on the first ballot, but nobody gets 50, this is what the second ballot looks like. This is what the third. And you really do see it changed. Mm -hmm. um, Rank Joyce Voting has real implications. It really does impact the ballot. Okay. And the legitimacy question has to do with, are they already known, right? Like, what is their already existing name ID likely prior to us even polling? Are they actually able to fundraise enough to even communicate to a certain mm -hmm. level, right? So we have strategic conversations with the team prior to coming up with the potential top six or top eight that we would present to voters. Yeah, and real quick, just on yes. the ranked choice voting, if you don't know what it is or you haven't looked into it, I mean, that was probably the big winner in 2022. Like, what won in 2022 is ranked ballot everywhere that was on the ballot. Uh, so I, I would say get, kind of get accustomed to it. Because it goes to your point. <laughs> People coming. want a second choice. Yeah. Okay, let's open up the floor here. We've got just a few minutes left before we have to get back on schedule. Are there questions? We've got pretty bright light, so it's kind of yeah. a little bit hard to see <laughs> you. <laughs> so, yes, I see a hand way in the back. I think there's a microphone coming for you. Okay, am I on? Okay, thanks for your comments. Those were great. Uh, my question, I'm Bob Penner from Canada. My question is, are any of you seeing any use of AI in polling? Any what? Any I'm what? sorry? AI. Oh, AI. Mm. I know we're starting to see it in the ads. Uh, we haven't seen it in the, in, in the polls yet, though. No. No bots. We have somebody else. But go to the next session. To plug yeah. the next Actually, session. Yeah. Go to the Chat 930 GPT, session. Right? GPT, yeah. Go yeah. to the, I think they'll talk about that directly after this, actually. Hi, my name is Aruna Yagari. I'm from New Jersey. I was part of the gubernatorial um, core team in the gubernatorial election where Jack Cirelli in New Jersey lost by three and a half points in 2021. So my question to you is, 
the pollsters predicted the loss by nine points. It turned out to be a ridiculous, well, good, 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 good show, but three point, about four uh, percent points. So uh, to the point where a pollster from Monmouth University had to publicly apologize for the gross uh, difference. Are there any lessons learned from that election? And how do you plan on incorporating those lessons going forward in the future elections? Thank you. Well, I think the guy from Monmouth specifically called out what, what he did wrong, and he got turnout wrong, right? There was a lot of voter anger that election, um, and you saw it in, in both of those states, and he said, I thought that turnout was gonna be narrower. I didn't think that there was gonna be this, this voter anger, um, and so I, I called the electorate wrong. I'd be interested to see if the campaigns had it that wrong. I did not work that race. I call it the myth of New Jersey. Republicans think they're going to win Jersey every cycle, and it never yes. happens. Yes. So um, I, I don't work in New Jersey. I don't know. if Did you work that race? I, I didn't work that, that race, but I, I think this is part of the broader conversation about poll aggregators and 100% speaks to my initial point, which is that our work is not designed to tell you who's going to win. Inside of the Murphy campaign, inside of your campaign, I can guarantee you that your pollster was not spending all of their time finding the uh, the exact right numbers to say that we're going to win. They were using those data to make their spending decisions, to make their message decisions, to make their tactical decisions, uh, uh, even as, as much as where you might deploy your last minute field resources. That is what our data uh, is designed for. Um, it is designed to make those decisions, not the you're gonna win by six, or you're gonna win by eight, or you're gonna win by nine. And, Almost in almost all of those cases, they're taking whatever polls exist out there in the universe to, you know, Brenda's point about the overall methodological quality, most of those aggregators treat garbage polls and good polls in, with equal yes. weight. My guess, oh, go ahead. And My guess is if the campaign was polling, though, to Jill's point, they're developing strategy that they should have seen it coming and said, oh my gosh, like, the, the Scott Brown election is the big, biggest example of this to me, where you saw, you're like, we're never going to win Massachusetts, we're never going to win, and they're all of a sudden, it's coming. It's coming. And that, so you, you, the campaign should have seen, like, we have a chance to win this and deploy resources. Right. I don't know. Sorry, did I cut you off? Oh, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending our panel today. We will conclude at this point. Thank to you. our panelists, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, AAPT. Great job.